For the rest of you, I encourage you to open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to be continuing our series through the book, a slow stroll through the book of 1 Corinthians. When Martin Luther's friend Philip Melanchthon lay dying, he wrote of how happy he would be to soon be free from what he called the rabies theologorum, or the madness of the theologians. By this, he meant the tendency of theologians to be constantly snapping at each other like rabid dogs. It's that prickly inclination to let second and third-tier issues trump the rallying cry of the gospel. But theologians aren't the only guilty ones, are they? Personalities, culture, preferences in politics, all of these can be equally present in the church and can equally trump the gospel. One author puts it this way, Evangelical tribalism is all too often not about doctrinal disagreement at all, however much it masquerades as such. Evangelical people, churches, and ministries can use theology to cloak the actual personal or political reasons why they do not have the degree of fellowship that their shared belief encourages. True evangelicalism should mean that we can enjoy hearty fellowship with other evangelicals without ever imagining that our fellowship implies our approval of everything they believe. But when loyalty to the gospel wanes, culture or personality-shaped empires mushroom where members of each tribe fear any association with outsiders because their association might be read as an endorsement of all the outsiders' alternative views. In such situations, precisely because the gospel is not the unifying factor, people become increasingly blind to the distinction between gospel issues and cultural differences. We are so much similar to Corinth. As I said last week, some people say, well, maybe we need to go back to becoming more like the first century church, and we discover that we're actually much more like the early church than we dare to admit. Here in this church, divisions grew as loyalty to the gospel waned. And in our passage this afternoon, we're going to find an urgent plea that is useful to our own souls. It's useful to our own church. And so if you would stand with me for the reading of God's word. First Corinthians chapter one, beginning in verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Well, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. Although I did baptize also the household of Stephanus, but beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. You can be seated. We saw last week that this church in Corinth 
had its eyes and its affections fixed on the surrounding culture, and they had lost sight of God's grace to them in Jesus. The city of Corinth mattered. Impressive people mattered. And these worldly values, not the gospel, was shaping the church's life in the present and in the future there in verses 4 through 9. But here, he's going to have one driving point, one big idea, beginning in verse 10 all the way through 17, and it's an idea that is setting up the next four chapters. And that big idea is this. Remember God's grace to you in Jesus and be united in him. Remember God's grace to you in Jesus and be united in him. We're going to see two things beginning in verses 10 through 12. We're going to see Paul's urgent exhortation, be united and then in verses 13 to 17, we're going to see his remedy for division. That is that we would remember God's grace. Be united. Remember God's grace. Notice in verse 10, he begins with an appeal, an urgent appeal. And that appeal specifically is for unity, and it is rooted in the grace that was pointed out in the previous verses. We noted how Time and again, Paul uses the language of calling that you have been summoned by God. And this is not of yourself. This is all of God's grace. All that you are and all that you have as a church has come to you by God's grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says there in verse 2 that this is true of all Christians. It's true of every true church everywhere. And all of that is implied in his in the name that he gives them, he says, I appeal to you, brothers. Notice also in verse 11, he calls them my brothers. This is family. He's calling a family meeting, so to speak. And to refer to them as his brothers is to refer to them as fellow Christians. And so even though Paul is approaching them with the authority of an apostle, he is also approaching them with the affection of a brother in Christ. Later on in the book, he refers to himself as their father, treating them like children. He refers to himself as their servant. That he has great affection for this church, and he is making his appeal on the basis of the grace of God to them in Jesus, and he is appealing to them as fellow Christians, as brothers. As those who, at the end of verse 9, have been called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ. And that fellowship that they have been called into is implicit in that language there in verse 10. That you've been, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you were to put your finger all the way back up there in verse 2 and you were to scan through the first 10 verses, you would notice that five times that language, our, is used. Verse 2, upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Verse 7, revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8, our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 9, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now here in verse 10, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to impress upon them that divisions in the church are contrary to both their identity in Christ and what they've come to possess together. You've heard me say before that two great themes that concern every local church is the theme of union and communion. That because we enjoy union with Christ, we've been united to him by faith, we now enjoy all of the blessings and the benefits of salvation that are found in him but we don't just enjoy those individually. We enjoy them in the communion of the saints. And within the context of that communion, God gives us many graces and benefits that we might serve one another. And so that union with Christ is meant to pull us in like a magnet. And in the context of being pulled in, that we would love one another according to his great grace to us. 
And so he wants to emphasize to them that he's making an appeal on the basis of grace as fellow Christians because of all that they share in Jesus Christ. And here's his appeal, that all of you agree. It's a bit of an awkward translation from Greek, but it's more accurately translated or literally that you would speak the same thing. We might think about it this way, that you would have a same confession, a shared confession, that all of you would be singing in harmony with one another on these most crucial items, that you would speak the same thing. And then in the second half of verse 10, he provides a couple of clauses to explain what he means, specifically that there be no divisions among you and, put positively, that you be united in the same mind And in the same judgment, he says, I want you to, I urge you, I'm pleading with you that you act in a way, think and act in a manner that is shaped chiefly by the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we see beginning in verse 11, the symptoms that have arisen. This is why he's making his appeal. He says, for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. First of all, I wonder what it must have been like to be sitting in this congregation when this letter was read, and Paul says, I heard from Chloe's people, and everybody turns and looks at Chloe. Where is that tattletale? But he says, here's what he's heard specifically, that there is quarreling among you. Now, he's not talking about mere disagreements. He's not saying, there are some things that I hear you're not seeing eye to eye on. The language of quarreling here can also be translated strife, rivalry, that you are breaking up into different factions against one another, and it is producing strife in the church that there is a kind of spiritual and emotional and perhaps even relational violence that is occurring from one member to another, from groups of members to other groups of members. No, no mere disagreements. It is strife in the church. And then he tells us specifically what that is in verse 12. The issue is not there that there's theological disagreement. Notice, for instance, Paul, Apollos, Cephas, and Christ are all going to agree theologically. So it's not some of you are claiming to follow teachers and, and leaders that contradict other teachers and leaders. It's not theological disagreement. And I don't think that we could say from verse 12 that it's division among the leaders themselves. They're in no way encouraging it. And it's not also the leader's popularity or the platforms that they have. Those things are not bad in and of themselves. We can give God lots of praise for platforms given to faithful and gifted brothers. But then what is the issue? The issue here is ultimately a cultural issue. Not merely that there are a handful of factions, but notice the language that he uses there in verse 12. What I mean is that each one of you says something. It's a cultural issue. And the problem is a cultural problem in the life of the church. It's a culture of self-promotion. He says, each one of you says, I follow, I follow, I follow, I follow, not we follow. This is an earthly or a worldly or a human, merely human way to think about it. I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or even I follow Christ. He rebukes them later on. Look at verse 3, beginning in or chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. He says, for you are still of the flesh. While there is jealousy and strife among you, quarreling, are you not of the flesh? behaving only in a human way? For one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos. Are you not being merely human? You say, well, of course they're human. He's saying, are you not merely acting in a worldly way as those who are not regenerated by the grace of God through the Holy Spirit? Are you not acting like Christians? 
In fact, he diagnoses their hearts even further, beginning in chapter 4. We're looking further in chapter 4, verse 6. He says, listen, I've applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us and not go beyond what is written. What are they doing? They're going beyond what is written. So that none of you may be, get this, puffed up in favor of one against another. There's some important things that we need to consider here. What Paul's ultimately getting at is not that there's something inherently wrong with valuing Paul's teaching or Apollos' teaching or Cephas' teaching. Ultimately, what's going on is a heart issue, and this heart issue among the members of this church had, been, had produced a kind of self-promoting culture in the church whereby these leaders became means for, this, for the members of this church to bask in their reflective glory that you could say something about yourself, about who you are spiritually, by who you aligned yourself with, which was really popular in Corinthian culture, and so they look just like the world. Well, specifically, what does it look like there in chapter 1? It looks like at least two things. It looks like, first of all, quarreling over preferred leaders. Take Apollos, for example. All the way back in Acts 18, we, we read that Apollos was, quote, an eloquent man, he was competent and fervent in spirit. I imagine that many in this church are saying, essentially, I'm an Apollos guy. That brother can really shuck the corn. Have you heard him teach? But it's not just quarreling over preferred leaders. Secondly, it's also quarreling over personal associations. Who baptized you? That might be a question that you hear as they gather around the table for dinner or walking down the street. Who baptized you? Hey, listen, Cephas is the one that baptized me, and I don't know if you've heard, but he's kind of a big deal. Paul says in 14, 15, and 16, man, I am so glad that I've not baptized many of you. I'm so glad that I'm not getting pulled into this controversy. I'm so glad that my name can't be invoked for the division of this church. Because baptism ultimately is not about the one baptizing, it is about Christ. It is about union and communion. It is about the gospel, and that's what I'm about. I'm about the gospel, so don't, don't drag my name in any of this. And so there's quarreling over preferred leaders, there's quarreling over personal associations, and it seems at the end of verse 12 that there's even quarreling that's being induced by a kind of super spirituality. I'm not really like all these others into labels and leaders. I just follow Christ. Of course, implied in that by the motivations that have been identified by Paul is to say implicitly, nobody else is. And so they're quarreling, and the quarreling is leading to division. Brothers and sisters, I think when we consider these first handful of verses, there's a few things that we can take away. Number one, it is a good thing to benefit from faithful Christian teachers and leaders. What this passage is not saying is that you cannot learn, that you cannot follow, that you cannot benefit from faithful brothers who preach the word well, truly, and faithfully. But what it is saying is that you cannot relate to them in a human way. You cannot relate to them in such a way that invoking their name or aligning yourself with that person is motivated in any way toward your own self-glorification. Toward, what did Paul say in chapter 4? Toward being puffed up in favor against others. I read John Calvin, I read John Piper, I read these others, and that person over there is still reading those old Max Lucado books. And it's not that John Calvin and John Piper and others wouldn't be beneficial, that you wouldn't benefit from them as they point you to Christ and help you better understand the Bible. Praise God for those brothers. And praise God even for the way that, that he's used Max Lucado and others to do the same thing for those who are just beginning their walk with Christ. Praise God for all of that. 
But where we start to get into tricky territory is when we start to exalt ourselves over others in our own hearts, thinking ourselves to be more spiritual, more faithful, more godly, and it leads us to distance ourselves from those saints. We're puffed up. And whenever we're puffed up, there's no room for anyone else in our orbit except for those who agree with us and follow those same kinds of leaders and teachers. But this is true not only of leaders, isn't it? It's true also of doctrines. And so a question that I think we need to ask ourselves in particular as a church is, do we or are we ever at the risk of giving disproportionate attention to our own pet doctrines? J.C. Ryle said this. He says, you may spoil the gospel by disproportion. You have only to attach an exaggerated importance to the secondary things of Christianity and a diminished importance to the first things, and then the mischief is done. Once alter the proportion of the parts of truth, and truth soon becomes downright error. Do this either directly or indirectly, and your religion ceases to be evangelical. It ceases to be rooted and centered on the gospel. Our day is not like any other day in the history of the Christian church where we are tempted to take those secondary and those tertiary doctrines and treat them like their primary doctrines, such that in doing so, we would break fellowship or distance ourselves from other true brothers and sisters in Christ, that we are not immune from what we discovered at the beginning of, of my sermon, as, as we heard from the author that I quoted, that that we ourselves aren't immune to taking our own cultural preferences or our own political convictions and clothing them up perhaps in a, in a shiny theological garb using theology. There's a variety of things perhaps in our own church that we need to be especially careful of. About our political theologies, about our millennial theologies, that in all of these and many other ways, we have to be especially vigilant. That we would not attach an exaggerated importance to the secondary things of Christianity. The problem is, is that when we turn every issue into a gospel issue, then we cannot rightly identify what is truly a gospel issue. And then nothing becomes a gospel issue. We have to be able to keep the gospel in its appropriate place, prioritizing it above all other secondary and tertiary doctrines. We need to guard against being puffed up, even with our own confession as we consider perhaps the Second London Confession. In what ways might we fall into this trap or this danger role. And one, it might say, we look at other churches around us and go, well, I'm this kind of confessional church or we hold to this kind of confession. And so that naturally makes us more spiritual or more godly and that we might distance ourselves from other true brothers and sisters in Christ. May that never be the case. You realize the primary purpose for confessions is not to draw hard lines on what makes us so different from every other Christian everywhere else. The primary motivation is to articulate clearly what draws us near to other faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. What makes us just like every other true Christian and every other true church that is gathered around this city, around the world, and through the ages. That's where we begin. Inevitably, there's going to be lines that are going to be drawn around secondary issues, which are important, around baptism and other things, but not in any way that would cause us to look at our Presbyterian friends, for instance, and say those are not true Christians, or that God somehow loves us and is more pleased with us because of our theology. That obscures the gospel. It brings disrepute to Christ. That can never be the case. It also means that we might look at a confession and we might treat every single chapter in there as a test of orthodoxy. And so we treat doctrines on the church and on worship and of civil magistrate as if they are first order doctrines alongside the doctrine of God and Christ. Beloved, that can never be the case. Once we do that, then we have devalued 
demoted the gospel as chief among all doctrines. A good confession helps us keep these things in priority, but that doesn't mean that we don't need to guard against becoming puffed up. Thirdly, we need to recognize that in our own church, disagreements are going to happen sometimes, aren't they? We're going to open up our Bibles, and we're going to try to discern what exactly it means, and we're going to work through that together. On this side of the resurrection, we will not be a disagreement-free church. That's reality. But here's the questions that you and I need to ask ourselves as we aim to, to cultivate a gospel culture in the life of our church. Do I care more about winning my argument than winning my brother or sister? Or perhaps do I and others leave my disagreements feeling built up or beat up? Listen, I've had, even over the last few months, I've had conversations with a number of saints in this church where we have had godly disagreements, and in those disagreements, we have left those conversations built up, not beat up. It's possible. Many of you also bear the wounds of being beat up in disagreement. And that's because there is an instinct in our churches and churches that care deeply about being Bible people to become a warring, factious, battle-hardened people. A kind of fundamentalistic spirit consumes us. One close pastor friend of mine once said this, and it's so helpful. He said, because we're convinced that our convictions are biblical, we'll go to battle over everything. All of our causes and crusades and wars are holy wars. And as a result, we tend to demonize those we disagree with. And the tragedy is that those who know the God of love, we above all people should be loving. And as those who serve the Prince of Peace, we above all people should be peaceable. But this is not our track record. And that wasn't the track record for this church either. And so Paul is urging them, I'm urging you, be united. Conform your life together and your attitudes and your actions chiefly around the gospel. And how are we going to do that? Verse 13, to remember God's grace. There in verse 13, he's going to ask three hypothetical questions. And the automatic answer that's given in each one of those questions gives us implicitly the encouragement that the Apostle Paul wants this church to hear. The first question is this, is Christ divided? Now, we should assume that all of the members in this church, having been taught by Paul for a year and a half and other faithful teachers in the church, would say, well, absolutely not. Christ isn't divided. That's ridiculous. But how often does our Confession coming off of our mouths have real dissonance from the way we live our lives. He says, is Christ divided? No. It's not that some of you have a little bit more of Christ than others. It's not that Christ has happened to apportion himself in greater ways to some of you and not others. No, all of you have been brought into the fellowship of his son. All of you enjoy fully the benefits and the graces and the blessings of the salvation that our Lord Jesus Christ has won for you. So no, Christ isn't divided. It's not more to him, less to you. There's no grades. This isn't like NBA 2K. Anybody get that? My brother or my, my son plays it all the time. You, gra you grade the, the players. He's a 98, he's an 87. Jesus doesn't grade us that way. There's no 98s in the church and 72s in the church. There are stronger brothers and weaker brothers, but even the strongest cannot lay a greater claim to Christ than the weaker. And no weaker brother can claim a greater claim to Christ than a stronger. We all have communion in him together such that all that is Christ's belongs to all of us all the time. And we get to enjoy that together and help one another benefit from it by the power of the Holy Spirit in his word. But he says, secondly, was Paul crucified for you? He's saying all the benefits and the blessings of salvation, is that ultimately come by me? Were you crucified with Paul? No. You have been crucified with Christ. Is it that you no longer live, but Paul lives in you? No. It is Christ that lives in you. 
And so he's answering these obvious rhetorical questions to encourage them in the reality that all of the blessings that you've received, the full forgiveness of sins, adoption into God's family, a, a righteous declaration over you as one who has been justified, a future inheritance, undefiled, imperishable, stored up in heaven for you, that's yours. And it's all in Christ. It's because he was crucified for you. But then thirdly, he asks, were you baptized in the name of Paul? No, that's foolish. To be baptized is to symbolize or to see outwardly the reality of our union with Christ, that we have been united to him, sanctified, verse 2, in Christ, brought into the fellowship of Christ, verse 9. Baptism shows all of that, but that's not all that it does. Baptism not only shows us how we have been united to Christ, but it also shows us how one sinner has been brought into the many. Baptism brings the one into the many, such that we would all be one body together, baptized with the same baptism. Just keep your finger here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I want you to go to chapter 12 because Paul summarizes exactly this point beautifully. He's arguing for the unity of the church. He's using these rhetorical questions to get to obvious answers, to build them up in the reality of the gospel. And this is what he says, beginning in verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. It's interesting, isn't it? When we go on later down in chapter 12, there seems to be excuses for some of the divisions that are being made in the church. Some saints are saying to one another, I have no need of you. Other saints are saying, I don't belong here. This has been endemic in the church and it's been due to the abuse of gifts, but it's been due in part to the, to the divisions that we see here in chapter 1 that when we puff ourselves so as to set ourselves against others, it creates a culture of I have no need of you and I don't belong here. Because I don't fit into that little tribe. I don't fit into that little subset. I don't hold precisely to every secondary or tertiary doctrine that that person holds to. I guess I'm on the outside looking in. Paul is driving home the reality that when the gospel is principal, that gospel that has been symbolized in baptism, the gospel that shows us that we are one in Christ, enjoying communion with one another as those who have been brought into his fellowship, that none of us can say, I have no need of you, and none of us can say, I don't belong, because we are one body, just as Christ is one. But he also says, were you baptized in the name? He's not only drawing attention to baptism, but he's drawing attention to the lordship of Christ. To say in the name of someone, to be baptized or do anything in the name of someone is to imply lordship and authority. It's to imply allegiance. Were you baptized ultimately out of allegiance to Paul? No. You were baptized out of allegiance to to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul, this is why he begins the letter the way that he does. Why would you ever claim allegiance to me? Verse one, I was just called by the will of God to be a messenger of God. There's nothing special about me. There's nothing more special about me than there is to you. I've just been given a, a specific vocation for the building up of the church by laying a gospel foundation for you to grow up into a spiritual house as living stones. That's my job, but I'm no less called than the rest of you. Why in the world would you be allegiant to me over Christ? But that's exactly what happens when the gospel ceases to be at the center of a church. Listen, it can get preached by a, by a pastor. It can be read. And it can be, in spite of all of those things, completely abandoned in all of its power in the life of the church. There's a disconnect, and that's what we see in verse 17. That when the gospel ceases to be the main thing, we will divide our church. And when we divide our church, we will functionally deny our union with Christ, and we will deprive each other of the gifts and the graces that God has given us for building one another up. We will, according to verse 17, 
empty the cross of its power. And so we need to consider then, brothers and sisters, what is the character of the preaching of our church? It doesn't matter whether I bounce all over the Bible and give you lots of scripture, it doesn't ultimately center on the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how theologically sound my sermons may be if it's not ultimately leading you to rest in Christ. If it's not ultimately aiming to shape the culture of our church in such a way that we would be constantly be reminded of his great grace to us in Jesus. But we also need to consider our own ministry to one another as we gather into one another groups and encourage one another. Listen, one of the things that I love about our church is that our church is a reading church. I love that many of our members love to read books. When I walk into my office and I look around at my library, what I see are brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the centuries, present day and in the past, that were true Christians filled with the Holy Spirit. And as I read them and walk with them, they help me and lead me into the scriptures and to delight in Christ. And they do the same for you. But brothers and sisters, we need to be careful that we're not just about the books. Many of us need to consider whether or not we need to be more about Bible than books in our time together. Those books are excellent, helpful servants, but they make for terrible masters for the unity of the church. Let them guide us. As we read them, let them encourage us. But not ultimately as ends in themselves to lead us to the word to lead us to Christ so that when we come together, we encourage one another according to God's word, not merely the words of men. We need to hold firm to the gospel. Michael Reeves, at the end of his book that he wrote, Gospel People, I think if anything, that could be probably the the title of this sermon. It's, It's Paul's point in this paragraph that we would be gospel people even as we aim to be confessional people, even as we aim to be theologically sound people, even if we aim to be evangelistic people, as we aim for all of these things, we must above all be gospel people. And in his book, he says this, holding firm to the gospel and holding it supreme, we reject all that opposes or presumes to rival it. And that must include the tribalism that elevates personalities, culture, politics, or any other issue to the level of the gospel. It's not saying those are unimportant issues, but those are not gospel issues. Because evangelicals seek, he says, before all things to be people of the gospel, not people of of a sect. That's Paul's point. You're breaking up into all of these sects. Sectarianism is fraying the church at its edges. And he's calling them and he's calling us back to our first love. You need to be gospel people. Let's pray.